In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God. If we name our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things and give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the Word into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew uh, chapter 18, verse 1. Matthew chapter 18, verse 1. And this is where we deal with something that our Lord is about to do. And He doesn't do it for the purpose of evangelizing this young child, He's going to point out. He does it for the purpose of teaching the disciples a lesson. 18.1, at that time the disciples came. Remember, Peter's out fishing and uh, they've gotten into a discussion of competition. And they're wondering which one is the greatest amongst them as disciples. And, of course, competition is not part of the Christian way of life, uh, yet they try to make it that way. So the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of God? And now Jesus is going to use the child as a training aid to teach the disciples doctrine. And uh, Jesus is not doing this to evangelize the little child. It's just that this little child becomes representative of any believer, uh, just as we are children of God. 18.2, He called a little child to Himself and had him stand among them. Now remember, our Lord is at Peter's house at this point, and we don't know who the little child is. Possibly it's Peter's child, but we don't know that. But we do know that Peter was married, and as a result, he probably did have children. It may have very well been Peter's child, and if it had been, it would have been a perfect example to show them competition is meaningless. Uh, but it could have been any child, uh, uh, maybe a visitor or anything else, just uh, coming over to watch the fireworks, maybe, of this uh, little discussion they're having. So he called a little child to himself, and he had him stand among them, and said... And then he says, verily, every time verily is found there, it means there's a point of doctrine, a point of truth. Unless you are converted and become like little children, and the reason our Lord says this is because little children have enforced humility, and they are under the rod of their parents, and when they get out of line, the parents spank them. If they're good parents, that's what they do. And then the children have enforced humility. And uh, they know not to talk back anymore. And if they talk back, they get to smacked on the hiney. And that's the only real place a child should get smacked is on the hiney. And then, uh, as a result, they have enforced humility. And he's using a child to show the disciples that they must be humble. And also, something else about children. They have a maximum use of faith perception. And we know that because when they go to school, they absorb everything. And the teacher says, one plus one equals two, Johnny. And Johnny believes it. And Johnny has no way to argue about it. And Johnny can't say, well, I think one plus one equals five. And you, they just don't do that. And it's faith perception. And faith perception says, yes, I hear that teacher and I believe it. And, and complete utilization of faith perception. And that's the way most children uh, live, by faith. That's why you can tell a, a four- or five-year-old that there's a Santa Claus, and they're going to believe it right off. And then Christmas time rolls around, and Santa brings presents. Even though he didn't, they believe it. Well, they have maximum amount of faith perception. They believe everything they hear, especially from people in authority. And uh, in this case, our Lord is saying, look at these little children. Uh, they don't have... Every time, if the Lord would tell this child something, he would probably immediately believe it. And unlike the disciples, and then the disciples would come back and say, well, the Pharisees something, say something else. What do you, how are you going to reconcile that? Well, a child's not going to do that. He's just going to hear it and say, yeah, I believe that. And that's the way children are. That's their system of perception, faith. There's also a little bit of empiricism, meaning that if, you, if they touch a hot stove, they find out it's hot and they're not going to touch it anymore. Well, that is learning by empiricism. But most 
of what children live, learn is by faith. And they're very willing to learn by faith when they're that young. But when you get older, you have a tendency to move toward arrogance and uh, try to uh, come up uh, with your own ideas, etc. And so he points out uh, the little child. You will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, so this is a point of doctrine. Unless you are converted and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. All our Lord is saying is, look, if you don't have faith like a little child and just uh, believe in Christ, you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven because without spiritual birth, there is no eternal life and there will be no spiritual life and they will not go to the kingdom of heaven. And this was directed mainly toward uh, Judas Iscariot, Iscariot because remember, all the disciples are there, all of which are believers except for one. And now he's teaching salvation. And he's telling how uh, you come to salvation. And uh, the only real person who needs this lesson is Judas Iscariot. And when they probably went in, this is just hypothetical thinking, when they probably went into competition with each other, Judas Iscariot was the most educated. And as being educated, he was very well versed on the styles of uh, argument. And uh, the Greeks love to argue all the time. And even if you're wrong, you could come up with a false premise and uh, and turn it all around and you look exactly like you know it all just because you're a good debater. Judas Iscariot would have been a good debater. All of that is not part of the Greek here and it's just speculation, so don't uh, uh, write it down or anything. But it's very possible that Judas Iscariot was winning over the argument. And so our Lord just comes up and, and gives the gospel and says, look, you've got to have faith like this little child. And Judas Iscariot did not. Then in 18.4, whoever humbles, whoever humbles. Now, humility means teachability. And if you're not humble, you're not teachable. And if you're always in competition, as these people were in competition, these disciples, and if you're always in competition with other believers, then you are not teachable. You've fallen under arrogance. And you, you're not like the little child. Now, children can be very uh, competitive, but when it comes to things that their parents tell them or that their teachers tell them, they usually absorb it very quickly. And they might become competitive as in who can remember what one plus one is first and, and who can remember this and that, but it was all started by faith perception. So whoever humbles, uh, whoever humbles uh, himself like this little child that he has uh, standing beside him, this believer is greater in the kingdom of heaven. What our Lord is saying is humility equals greatness. And humility equals uh, a greatness that lasts into eternity. And if you're humble, that uh, greatness of humility lasts into eternity. That is for the humble believer. And that's because humble, humble believers uh, get with the Word of God. It's inevitable. Arrogant believers never get with the Word of God. They think they know it all already, and they just, they're not going to listen to it. They've been raised in legalism. They've been raised in religion. And they won't even give it a chance. And why not? Arrogance. And how come uh, people won't give doctrine a chance? And you might scratch your head and wonder, well, why don't they just listen just long enough to where they might catch on to it? They're too arrogant. They think they know it all. And when they hear something different than what they've been taught, they say, I've been taught differently. I'm not going to believe that. Uh, without even uh, giving it a hearing, without even trying to check Scripture with Scripture, it's complete arrogance. The ignorance of arrogance, actually. And if they were interested, I mean, uh, I can understand if you've been raised a certain way and you come into contact with messages concerning grace and you say, I don't know about that. I've never been taught that. Well, anyone who's been raised under legalism uh, comes to that crossroads. Uh, I never had to because I was graced out and blessed enough to grow up in a grace-oriented family. But my father uh, did not have that uh, privilege. And he... Uh, heard the colonel one day on the radio in Pennsylvania, and he was talking about how religion is not Christianity. Religion is man by man's own efforts trying to work his way into heaven. And at first it was so brand new to him, he said, no, I don't know about that. And then he kept listening. He had the humility not to just switch the channel, but to listen to what he had to say. And he finally came down to the point where he said, you know, that man's right. 
And he said that, and uh, it wasn't till years later that he uh, really got on tapes because his brother-in-law had been uh, listening to tapes. And uh, because he desired it, God at the right time sent it to him. He wasn't quite ready for it at that point, even though he agreed with it. And then later on, his brother-in-law got him hooked on a book called Grace by Lewis Ferry Schaefer. And then he went on to listen to Colonel Thien tapes. And, and I've always found it phenomenal how people get on doctrine who want it. But most people don't, and uh, most people don't want it because of arrogance. They're not humble enough to be, uh, well, objective. And there comes a point in life where you have to be objective. Maybe all the things that you learned as a child, they, maybe they weren't all right. Maybe there were some things that were uh, way off doctrinally, and you have to come to a reconciliation at some point. That's all part of thought testing. And a doctrine's always going to test your thinking. And some people are raised to be atheists. It does happen. It's a sad thing. And uh, they'll come into contact with the Word of God and they will, they will say to themselves, well, uh, that guy from Australia, didn't, uh, he didn't say that. But this guy is saying that. And they can be arrogant about it and say, I reject it. Or they could be humble about it and have some objectivity and look it up, start studying it, get an interest in it and then come to their conclusion, all part of thought testing. And uh, the disciples were now under a type of thought testing because they were all competing with each other on how who's going to be the greatest. And now the Lord just brings up a little child, showing humility. Now from this, we're going to have to take down the doctrine of humility, which is very important. Now I can't remember if I went over this in the Essential Series. I think I went over arrogance for sure in the Essential Series. And uh, some of these uh, doctrines might overlap. Um, I just can't remember if I went over the doctrine of humility, but we'll do it again because it's being brought up here by our Lord, and it's very important. And we have to understand what humility is before we can ever grow in grace and in knowledge uh, because we have to know for ourselves that we are humble. So this is a definition of humility, a short one, a one-sentence definition. Humility is freedom from pride and arrogance. Humility is freedom from pride and arrogance. And therefore, humility cannot and does not exist in the cosmic system. Now, for those of you who like to take notes, uh, I would love for you. I would love to just sit up here and teach it real slow so you could get it all down. Uh, but uh, the fact is, there's so much here, I'm not going to be able to do that. I'll give you some very specific things that you might need to write down and then just move on. And I might even uh, just type all of this up and give it as a handout. So uh, uh, you can write notes if you want, if it helps you retain. But I'm going to go through this a bit too quickly for you to uh, really get it all down, except for some few major points. So humility cannot and does not coexist with the cosmic system. And remember, the cosmic system is that system that is antithetical to the divine dynasphere or God system for us, and it is actually a type of counterfeit. And Satan's system has a counterfeit humility, and his counterfeit humility is when people act humble, and it's all superficial, And it, but humility is in the inside, and uh, people who have been the most humble on the face of the earth have been called the most arrogant because it wasn't superficial to them, it was something that occurred on the inside. And a perfect example of that would be Moses, because uh, Moses was the most humble man on the face of the earth at that time, and yet everyone uh, he was teaching, with the exception of Caleb and Joshua and a few others, said, this man is arrogant. He talks to us like we're nothing, and he's arrogant. Well, he wasn't arrogant. He had a message. He was a servant of God, and he was going to give it, and he was perfectly humble. Yet everybody transferred their arrogance onto him, Operation uh, Transference or uh, Projection. That's the word for it. Operation Projection. Projected their arrogance onto Moses. Now, when you get out of fellowship, that is, you start out filled with God the Holy Spirit. When you get out of fellowship, every time you get out of fellowship, it's because of arrogance. In some subtle way, it is. And you say, but uh, I just committed a, a sexual sin. I fornicated or something just by example. How is that arrogant? Well, that's the arrogance of uh, sex. And you have just uh, uh, put the pleasure of sex above God's mandates. That's self-absorption. And uh, it's self-seeking. You're self-seeking pleasure. 
and uh, you'll get it, but it's all part of arrogance. So, a fornication in itself, even though it's uh, not really part of the arrogance complex of sins, it is a result of arrogance, thinking that your pleasure is greater than your love for God. And when you do it, it is. And when people fornicate, God's the last thing from their minds. And that's just the way it works, or commit adultery or anything else. So really, all sins are related to arrogance and self-absorption and all of those things, including gossip, maligning, and judging. Those become part of the arrogance complex of sins, but they're all self-serving. And none of it has to do with the unique spiritual life. And therefore, uh, sometimes, uh, I'll tell you what I do, a little trick I use. If I don't know if I'm in fellowship or not, it's rare, but if I don't, I'll say, uh, well... Uh, before I go into prayer or study or whatever, I'll say, well, Father, I committed arrogance. Because it pretty much covers the whole gambit of sins. It really does. It's a good way to know if you're going to be in fellowship if you're not sure. And that's what I do. And it's not really a trick. The fact is, all sins are related to arrogance. It, there's just no way around it. So humility cannot and does not exist in the cosmic system. That is, when you're out of fellowship, you're not humble. When you're out of fellowship, you're under the system of arrogance, under Satan's system, which is the cosmic system, which was developed as uh, to be arrogance because Satan from the beginning uh, became arrogant when he fell. So what happens when you go out of fellowship is you, flaw, you fall under the concept of the energy of the flesh rather than uh, the divine viewpoint or the divine power that has been given to us and you go into the energy of the flesh. And if you stay out of fellowship long enough, you'll go into human good. It's inevitable. Now, if you uh, commit a sin and then immediately rebound, you're showing great humility. Tremendous humility. In fact, the first uh, act of humility for any Christian is 1 John 1.9. You've just admitted that you've sinned. And that takes humility to admit that you're wrong. Now, there's two, different, there's two different things you could do or two different categories you could follow. You could sin and you could say, all right, I've sinned, I recognize my sin, I'm going to name it to God, admit it to God, and therefore I'll be forgiven. That would be an act of humility. Or you could go toward arrogance and justify your sin. And you could say, I was angry with him because he deserved my anger and my wrath. Well, no, you're in arrogance, you're not forgiven. Or you could say, uh, I will deceive myself into thinking that I was right, I had a right to be angry, I had a right to be frustrated, I had a right to be irritated. None of us have that right. It's a sin. But we'll say it to ourselves, and that's showing arrogance. The only real right you have is to show humility, which is to name that sin to God. If you've been frustrated, irritated, mad at somebody, well, name it. Get moving. And that means you have humility, and now you'll function outside of the energy of the flesh and inside the divine dynasphere or your unique spiritual life. Now, when you get out of fellowship, you will immediately move into the arrogance complex, as I've said. It's inevitable. That's Satan's system. Satan began... uh, When did Satan fall? When he became arrogant. When, uh, When do we, as believers, get outside of our spiritual life? When we become arrogant. So when you fall under the arrogance complex of sins, you seek human solutions to all your problems. You forget about your spiritual life and you're functioning under arrogance because you start to lean upon your own understanding instead of putting all your faith and trust in God. And this results in failure to recognize the divine solution to life. Instead, uh, you uh, seek human solutions to life. And sometimes those human solutions might pull you through some situations for a little while. But at some point, if you stay long enough under the cosmic system as a believer, God is going to punish you and put you into such a helpless situation that the only way out is the divine solution. And there are no human solutions when you get in that situation. And a lot of things can be solved by money. I understand that. And it's really not a problem if you can solve it with money. But God will sometimes put us in a state in which uh, we might be about to die. And then when we're about to die, we feel completely hopeless. 
And that's our point when we say there's no human solution, no money, uh, nothing that can get me out of this situation except uh, uh, the spiritual life. And then you rebound and get back with it. And that sometimes occurs. And sometimes people just never wake up and die arrogant and miserably. So arrogance has a lot of facets. It has so many facets that we, I can't really categorize all of them. There, it's impossible because uh, it's Satan's system. He's a genius and he has made so many facets of it that sooner or later all of us will be captured by arrogance. All of us, myself included, every single one of us will be captured by this system. Uh, the uh, only solution is rebound. Once we recognize it, name our sins, get back into fellowship. And uh, usually, uh, if you're positive toward the Word and you've made Bible doctrine number one, you'll slip into arrogance every now and then, but you'll learn to stay out of it for most of your life, and therefore uh, you will not be under the cosmic system. But if you neglect the Word of God or reject the Word of God, then uh, you're definitely going to fall under arrogance. You're going to fall under the cosmic system, which means you're going to fall under the doctrines of demons. If you stay away from the Word long enough, it opens up what's called pneumatikos in, or uh, uh, matayotes in the soul. And that means uh, a vacuum. And it's going to suck in all the false doctrines. And if you stay out of fellowship long enough, uh, you won't be recognized. You might have been a person taking in doctrine for years and then suddenly uh, neglect it. And that's usually how it first starts off. You neglect it. The other important things to do. And then, eventually, you simply reject it. And it follows in that course. And then, after rejecting it, uh, you slip deep into the cosmic system. And uh, you cannot be uh, distinguished from an unbeliever. And I've known people who were so positive for the Word, you'd never think this would happen to them. And uh, now, those same people are practicing Buddhism. And, and, and a believer would look at that person and say, that person needs to be saved. That person's been saved. That person even grew in grace a little and then fell all apart. Well, arrogance got a hold of them and sucked them outside the spiritual life. So the only way we as believers can ever have virtue is to have humility. And humility is total freedom from the cosmic system. Now, you might have a, a different attitude about what humble is, and you might say, oh, that person is humble. For example, you might watch uh, some great football player win a football game and afterwards he shuffles his feet and says, ah, oh, it was nothing. Uh, it doesn't mean he's humble. He, he's doing it for the camera, and he's doing it because there'll be a lot of people at home saying, oh, that man is humble. And it's really, uh, behind it all is a bunch of arrogance, and you'll ra rarely, rarely find people who are famous as being humble. Well, they uh, they live the life where everyone's told them how great they are, and if you have everybody telling you how great you are, you're, you're going to start believing it. And you're going to start uh, thinking of yourself as uh, tremendous and great and powerful. And the Romans understood arrogance in this way because the Romans had some great generals that would go out and wipe out entire countries. And when they would come back, there would be a little slave boy sitting behind the chariot as they went through the parade. And these parades were extravagant, and everybody lavished their praise on these young men returning from battle. And the little slave boy would be behind the chariot, the man riding in the chariot, and whisper into his ear, Sink Troxit, Sink Troxit, Gloria Mundi. The glory of the world passes away. In other words, don't get a fat head. You're young now. Soon your human power is going to fade away, and nobody's even going to remember you when you're 80 years old and dying. So don't get all swept up into this right now, is what they were saying. A very uh, smart thing for the Roman custom to do to keep people from becoming too arrogant. And oftentimes these people who have uh, been so famous and then they get older and lose their beauty, especially this happened a lot with uh, uh, women who became very famous because of their beauty. And then when they got older and forgotten, they became very bitter because they've always wanted to go back to that approbation lust. And they died miserably. And uh, that's all part of arrogance. So virtue for the believer is humility. Humility is total freedom from the cosmic system. Humility includes uh, two forms of it. There's enforced humility, and there is genuine humility. Now, enforced humility occurs mainly when we are under the authority of our parents. It also occurs if you go into military service. 
they will enforce humility on your butt. And they will chew you out up one side and down the other. And uh, for no reason, maybe. Just uh, You might think the guy's psychotic. I would. Uh, you're just standing there. They say attention. And they look in your eyeballs and then uh, rip you apart. You don't even know what you've done. And uh, you might think, this man's crazy. And so a lot of the people who haven't been adjusted to uh, they didn't get enough enforced humility in the home, a lot of these people would uh, look at that drill sergeant and say, you don't talk to me that way. And then the drill sergeant would punch him in the stomach and you would lose all your air and you can't go running home to mommy and say, he punched me, it's too late now, you're in the military, they own you. And get down and do a hundred push-ups and you can barely breathe and you got to do it. Well, they're enforcing humility on you because when you're in the battlefield, uh, they want you to listen to your commanders and to be trained so well that you'll do exactly what they say. And if they say move forward and there's a hell of bullets, you run toward the bullets because you're scared of the man in charge. And that's how they enforce humility. And we all receive it in childhood when we receive spankings and we deserve it. That's enforced humility. And it results usually, unless you're a vessel of dishonor, which the Bible talks about, it results in having a genuine humility. And this is genuine humility. And this genuine hum humility plus uh, equals objectivity plus teachability. And so learning doctrine requires humility because doctrine uh, steps on all of our toes. And when it does, it requires humility. So remember the three R's. There is reception in which the pastor communicates Bible doctrine to a group of believers. That's reception. Then there is retention. And retention is epinosis doctrine. Remember what epinosis is. Epinosis is gnosis being con converted into epinosis in which uh, you apply doctrine to experience. And uh, this is the basis for creating invisible heroes, and that is from recall. And recall is the application of doctrine to experience. Recall. So we have reception, retention, and recall, all of which are related to humility and teachability. And if you are arrogant, you won't have reception. Remember the Pharisees were very arrogant, so they could not receive doctrine. And they never would retain it nor recall it because they didn't care for it. So enforced humility is submission to legitimate authority. And humility is the virtue of freedom from arrogance. All of us have authority in life. Some of us have authority we don't like. I've had some bosses in the past whom I have absolutely had uh, no personal respect for, but uh, from enforced humility, or actually in this case from genuine humility, you have to do what they say and you have to follow their orders no matter how stupid they are. And I've had some uh, request of you the impossible. And yet, uh, you just do what you can and then go home when they let you go home and don't worry about it. And work is unto the Lord, not as unto man. Uh, but they're still your authority and uh, that doesn't give you a right to just say, well, I quit this job, my uh, boss is a uh, uh, an idiot. Or you could use harsher terms, usually people do. And uh, you don't have that right. If you do that, it shows a lack of genuine humility. And you must have genuine humility and if a better deal comes along, well, go ahead and take it. But uh, remember, sin natures are prevalent everywhere. And you're never going to have a perfect boss. And you've got to get out of the hypersensitivity mode and get into the mode in which you can accept authority. And that's the only way to grow in grace and in knowledge. So enforced humility is submission to legitimate authority. Uh, you have authority in school, the authority of your teachers. I know how it is. I had some bad teachers. I had an algebra teacher. She was terrible. She won't listen to this, so I can say it. She was absolutely horrendous. Uh, she didn't like to teach. She was bored with teaching, about to retire. And she didn't care for the students. And uh, uh, she would just have us read the book or just go over something, then test us half to death. And uh, most of the class was failing. Now, when most of the class is failing, there's something wrong with the teacher, not with the students. Uh, yet she would blame it all on the students who were failing. Well, she's doing a bad job if they're not getting it. And she was. 
but she was the authority, and I couldn't just uh, go up to her as one guy. Who, this is what he said. He was sitting uh, next to me, and uh, one time uh, he got a bad grade, or she she said something to him, and uh, she was she had an irritating voice and everything like that. And uh, he was sitting there, and he just said, uh, and this was in tenth grade. I know all of you have heard this word, so don't look shocked. He said, "You bitch." I mean, really loud. I don't think he meant to say it loud. He just got so frustrated he said it. And she looked at him, but she didn't say nothing. In fact, she had a smile on her face as if, yes, I know it. <laughs> but uh, he shouldn't have done that. That means you are not uh, oriented to authority. She was his authority. And in the olden days, if he would have done that, doesn't matter if he was in the 10th grade, he, he would have had a red bottom on his way home probably. You just never did uh, say that to authority. But today, uh, children are so out of line that uh, they can't even keep the classroom in order. That is, some of them, uh, they've separated them out now to where there's the college level going to college and then the, uh, the other levels. So they try to separate it out for those who want to go forward can. But even there, there's a lot of discipline problems, all related to arrogance. And if a whole generation comes up with no uh, submission to authority, it, it can destroy a nation in one generation. They won't be able to accept the authority of their teachers, their parents. If they have to be drafted, they won't accept the authority of the military. They'll start burning draft cards and they'll start running to Canada and our nation will be left wide open. And that's exactly what would happen today. Now, people are protesting this war today and there is no draft. It makes no sense. The people who are in Iraq make a choice to go. They said, I'm going to serve, especially lately since we've been there for so many years. The people who are joining say, I want to go. And then when people protest it, you are actually disdaining their choice. And it's an honorable choice that they have made. And nobody forced them to go. They said, I want to go. And it's not because they're poor that they're going. They want to serve their country. And it's, it's written, people still protest. Imagine if the draft suddenly came back. Or some, oh, this country would fall apart. They would, it, nobody would be able to handle it. And I don't care even if it was a direct attack. We had a direct attack on 9-11. And still people protest as if we started this war. It's insanity. And there is insanity out there. And because of that, and because of lack of interest in doctrine, things are only going to get worse for this country. And uh, I hope not. It's not my hope. But it just seems to be heading in that direction. And uh, maybe when it does, people will wake up and realize, hey, that man was right. Hey, this doctrine is right. There's something definitely wrong out there. A lot of it has to do with arrogance. Actually, all of it has to do with arrogance. Too arrogant to be instructed. And as I told you before, only 26% of the nation even goes to church once on Sunday. How are you going to get anybody to come to church every day except Saturday? Impossible. And so uh, the fact that we have this uh, much of a crowd, actually, it's encouraging to me, not discouraging to see the many faces I do, well, I've never been in contact with as many positive people in this area in South Carolina ever, except when I was at maybe two in the 80s, there was a group maybe this big in Columbia, and Columbia is a lot bigger than Anderson. So this area does seem to be positive, uh, at least uh, in terms of percentage-wise. I mean, go to New York City. How many people in New York City with 14 million people are you going to find going to a doctrinal church? Zero. <laughs> That's, uh, so it is encouraging that when, when you put it into perspective. And Houston's a large city, but it's one of the more positive cities, and uh, even they don't have a... Uh, well, the church isn't overflowing like it used to, I'll say that. So uh, there's a meaning and a definition to humility, and we'll get to that. Humility is the quality or status of being humble. And uh, that, of course, is uh, taking the noun humility and uh, giving us the verb form. While the, while the noun humble has many definitions ranging from feeling of insignificance and feeling of inferiority. That would be a wrong... What, that's not the biblical definition. I mean, we might uh, per perceive it that way. If somebody is humble, they must feel insignificant or they must have an infor inferiority complex. That is not the meaning of humility. In fact, when you have an inferiority complex, you think of yourself as low in rank or low in importance. And none of these definitions relate to the biblical word. None of them. 
So humility or being humble in the protocol plan of God is recognition of the authority of Jesus Christ. And remember, this was something that Peter had trouble doing because he was always trying to get Peter, always trying to get Jesus to follow him when uh, Peter should have been following the Lord. And that's why God the Father came down and with his booming voice and bright glory said, listen to him. Peter had a problem with uh, humility. He thought of himself as way higher than he should have thought of himself. So humility is recognition of authority. And since the Bible is the thinking of Christ, submission to authority of our Lord is tantamount to having the thinking of Christ, which can only come through post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation. And that means, of course, uh, perception, uh, per uh, metabolization, and application of the Word of God. So we submit. How do we submit ourselves to the Lord? We submit ourselves by our daily intake of the Word of God. That is how we submit ourselves, and that shows humility. If we neglect doctrine, we're in a state of rebellion, or if we reject it, of course. So the result of our post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation is grace orientation and humility. The both, both of them go together. And grace orientation is uh, very important for a church because if a church has grace orientation, the congregation doesn't focus on the sins of the believers involved. We all have an old sin nature, and your sins are none of my business, and my sins are none of your business. And so we're able to sit here in comfort and, and not worry about being talked about. And that is a wonderful thing about grace, and that's coupled with humility and to where people can feel comfortable no matter what to listen to the Word of God because all of us uh, don't deserve to breathe, yet all of us are breathing, and since we're breathing, we have a right to listen to the Word of God no matter what we've done, and no matter anything. It doesn't matter. And God provided for all that in eternity past, and He even provided for us as being failures. Remember, Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. So there's uh, nothing... Uh, that is the result of humility and grace orientation. And most churches don't teach that today. And all it is is a big cesspool of gossip, maligning, and judging. They said New Orleans might turn out to be a cesspool. Well, I think churches around here and around the country are cesspools of gossip, maligning, and judging. And I would probably rather be on a rooftop in New Orleans than in one of those churches where all that gossip, maligning, and, and uh, judging goes along. And I'm serious about that, too. I would probably rather be on a rooftop waiting to be rescued than in one of those churches. That I wouldn't be able to handle it. I would get out of line because I would want to change them all, and it wouldn't be my purpose. And so I just don't go. Never will go. Uh, I have gone in the past uh, just because a relative has went when I was younger and didn't know any better. But I still kept my mouth shut except for one time, and I won't talk about that. But uh, most of the time I was able to hold it all in. So in biblical humility, the independence of human power and ability is reduced to zero. In biblical humility, we're talking about uh, how we should be humble in regards to our unique spiritual life. It is the independence of human power and ability is reduced to zero. Uh, that means human power has its own independence. We have independence in, re in relation to human power. We can get up and go to work and make money and provide, and we're all commanded to, uh, the husbands are, uh, to uh, provide for the family, and that's, uh, and that's part of our the independence of human ability and a command. But uh, if you have a car accident and you become helpless and paralyzed, then what? It's a total dependence on God, which is what it always has been anyway. And it's total dependence on Him for us to take one more breath and one more day, one more time. Anyway, while the filling of... So we have the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, and grace orientation and doctrinal orientation. That was a song, by the way. My wife knows it. I don't know if you've heard it. And then there's personal love for God the Father, impersonal love for all mankind, and sharing the happiness of God, and occupation with Christ. And all of this is the higher level, the higher function of humility. 
and I'm going over this quickly, but we should remember what the ten problem-solving devices are, and we should remember these as part of them, the filling of God the Holy Spirit. Of course, there's the faith rest drill that comes next, and use of that does demonstrate some uh, humility uh, because it takes you out of the equation and you're resting in the Lord. So there's humility in that. There's tremendous humility in grace orientation because you get your eyes off yourself and your eyes off people and your eyes on the Lord. And then doctrinal orientation, a personal sense of destiny. And that's when we receive spiritual self-esteem. And spiritual self-esteem, uh, while it might uh, sound uh, as involving arrogance, it doesn't. Actually, when you receive that, uh, you actually are the most stable person on the face of the earth because you lose an inferiority complex if you have it, and you lose arrogance if you've uh, been prone to that. Personal love for God the Father, impersonal love for all mankind, sharing the happiness of God in occupation with Christ, this is the highest level of function for humility. In biblical humility, the independence of human power and ability is reduced to zero, and you should have that point already. Now, eventually, we'll be getting to a lot of verses dealing with this. Now, this is just an introduction to it, and a lot of these verses will explain it much better. Now, oftentimes, the believer is brought to a point of helplessness, such as the Apostle Paul was brought to a point of helplessness so that he would stop depending upon his own human power and ability. And remember, the Apostle Paul had tremendous human ability. He was a genius. He was one abnormally born, uh, probably the greatest genius ever in human history uh, outside of Caesar, but even probably greater than that. And he also, also had a spiritual component to it, which added to it all. So the Apostle Paul had a tendency uh, toward arrogance at one point because of the exceeding revelations that he had received from uh, God the Father and the fact that uh, he had a special spiritual gift called apostleship. And he knew more than anyone on the face of the earth about doctrine. And he knew it. And uh, he did not become arrogant because of it, but he was about to. And uh, he was about to really uh, get off track. So what the Lord did is made him uh, go into a totally helpless situation. And that's called the thorn in the flesh. And in fact, uh, God the Father actually allowed a demon to attack him uh, in all different ways. And the thorn in the flesh, everybody tries to figure it out, was it because he was bald and fat? No, that's not a thorn in the flesh. It might be to some spiritually immature people who are bald and fat and have an inferiority complex about it. But for the Apostle Paul, that wouldn't have bothered him at all. And the rumor is that's what he was, bald and fat. But we don't know that for sure. But that wasn't the problem. He was under tremendous people testing. He was actually under uh, the four categories, PTSD, people, thought, system, and disaster testing. He was under all four of them. And uh, it doesn't refer to one specific thing, but he was getting hit on all sides. And what do they say? When it rains, it pours? Well, in this case, for the Apostle Paul, it didn't just rain, it started pouring. And he was in a helpless situation, and even though he was a genius, and he, even though he had all this doctrine, he made a mistake uh, at first. And this is when he went to the Lord in prayer and said three times, take it away, take it away, take it away. And you might say, why is that a mistake? He's simply going into prayer and saying, take it away. He, he used a prayer as a solution, a human solution. And you say, but isn't prayer a divine solution? Yes, when it's used correctly. But in this case, he was being tested, and he should have recognized that he was being tested. And uh, we've all went into prayer when we were tested, and uh, sometimes the testing has gone on, and sometimes the punishment has gone on, and it's all because we needed it uh, to help us grow in grace. Because if the Lord had answered the Apostle Paul's prayer and removed the testing, he would have also removed the resultant blessing and his resultant spiritual growth. So God didn't take it away. And then after that, the Apostle Paul learned his lesson. And what he came to a conclusion, he came to a conclusion called an elative conclusion in the Greek. You're not going to find this in the English, but it's an elative conclusion all there in the Greek. You see, Greek was such an in-depth language that we can't transliterate it all, and we can't just take one word for one word. You know, when you study Spanish, usually you take one word in the Spanish and translate it into English. And the same for German and most of... But uh, uh, Greek, the Greek language is far more in-depth. 
And people have written paragraphs concerning one word in the Greek language. And so what we have here is an elative conclusion in which the Apostle Paul actually said, the divine solution is the only solution. The human solution is no solution. That shows he finally got with humility. He realized he couldn't solve the problems with his human power. He had to use divine power. And what divine power did he have? The filling of God, the Holy Spirit. Operation Z, the three spiritual skills, the four spiritual mechanics, all the ten problem-solving devices. What should the Apostle Paul have been doing while he was suffering instead of praying? He should have, first of all, he didn't need to rebound. He was in fellowship, uh, and it, except uh, to the point of frustration. He may have popped in and out every now and then, but when he did, you just uh, rebound. And then you have uh, the filling of God, the Holy Spirit. Then the faith rest drill. And then grace and uh, doctrinal orientation. And then a personal sense of destiny. And then personal love for God and personal love for all mankind. And that's what he could have been using uh, while all the Judaizers were attacking him. He could have used impersonal love for all mankind, motivated by personal love for God the Father. And he could have had sharing the happiness of God. And what is that? That is, the Apostle Paul could be under such torment and yet be utilizing, sharing the happiness of God and be completely happy even though in extraordinary pain. And you say, how is that possible? Well, our Lord did it. He had exhibited happiness on the cross even while he was dying as a substitute for us. And we've been given the same spiritual life. And that is phenomenal. And that is what Paul should have used. And he finally got enough humility to use it. And the Apostle Paul went the full route of the unique spiritual life. And uh, nobody's been able to touch him since. And I doubt anyone ever will. Although we do have equal privilege and equal opportunity to follow in those footsteps. So biblical humility is neither derogatory and nor does it uh, require, require self-depreciation or self-deprecation in which uh, uh, you feel inferior. You know, there's been some comedians who have made uh, lots of money because they felt inferior about themselves, and so they get up and make fun of themselves and make a living doing it. I think there's uh, one hilarious man. I don't remember his name, but he is fat. Very, He's a very large man, and he always makes fat jokes all the time. And he talks about when he goes to the buffet, how people, how the restaurant managers are all uh, uh, checking their pockets for money or whatever. He's funny. He's a comedian. But he's making a living uh, being uh, self-deprecating. And uh, he probably really doesn't care now that he's making all the money. But uh, that is not what humility is. And we might say, that, fam that fat man's humble. At least he's got enough of courage to get up and say he's fat and make fun of himself. And you know, there, there is something to being able to make fun of yourself because uh, I read today there was a woman in New Hampshire and uh, she was obese, I think 150 pounds overweight. And she went to her doctor. And her doctor, now this doctor had been, has been known to be blunt, but he's a, he's a doctor for obesity. That's why she was going there. And she was going to get uh, some type of diet plan and pills and all that. And uh, he had always been known to be blunt with his patients, and it's a patient-doctor uh, confidentiality. He's not telling everybody about her, but he likes to shock them so that they realize uh, that uh, they're, they're hurting their health. And he told this woman, you are fat and obese, and unless you lose weight, you're going to die. And you know what she did? She went out and sued the guy. Now, that's disgusting, and that's what's happened to our culture. Uh, suing for everything. Sued him because she got insulted. Well, she could look in the mirror and see that she was fat, and if she didn't want to hear anything discouraging, then she shouldn't have went to a fat doctor to get healed. And this is just ridiculous. All she needed to do was cut back on eating and exercise anyway. But no self-discipline, see? So it's just a fat lady now with a chip on her shoulder, and uh, I'll call her fat, come sue me, I ain't got nothing. And she is... Uh, and she is way out of line, and it's a sign of the culture, and it's a sign of arrogance. How arrogant. You know what else is arrogant? Uh, people who get uh, lung cancer and then sue tobacco agents. Well, it says on the pack, if you smoke it, you're going to die. And how can you sue them? They've told you that. And if you continue doing it, it's your choice, and it's unhealthy. 
And I say that as a hypocrite, but it's right there on the packet. And so if I ever get lung cancer and start hacking up blood and laying on a bed about to die, I'm not going to sue the tobacco company. It's all part of arrogance and also greed, which too is part of arrogance. But it all shows a, ter a terrible trend in our country toward hypersensitivity. And you can't even go to a doctor and get a correct diagnosis without the doctor worrying about being sued. It's a terrible time in our country's history. And that is all related to the fact of arrogance and no humility. Now, humility is a system of thinking and it is a way of life. Humility is a system of thinking, and it is a way of life. And the Bible commands us to be humble in James 4.10. This is a very famous passage, and it should be uh, even more famous uh, today as since arrogance is such a problem. James 4.10, humble yourselves before the Lord. Now, this is a mandate that precedes any effective use of the problem-solving dev devices. Excuse me. What it's saying is, Humble yourselves before the Lord. In other words, if you don't humble yourself, uh, you're not going to grow in grace and in knowledge. Actually, this is a prerequisite. And what is the first act of humility in the Christian way of life, as I told you earlier in the beginning? The first act of humility is 1 John 1, nine. You admit that you've sinned. Uh, you've been angry with someone, and instead of justifying it all day long, you simply go to God and, sit and say, I was angry. You don't even have to mention to, to whom you were angry, because when you sin, you sin against God only. And you just say, God the Father, or, or dear Heavenly Father, I had anger today. And then, that, in Christ's name, Amen. Then you're forgiven. And uh, that is the first act of humility. And, or it might be the uh, 12 millionth act of humility on your part. Uh, and because, uh, remember, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins uh, every time we do it. And we might sin, and we do, every day. And we might sin 10, 20, 30, 40 times a day, but every time we name it, we're forgiven. That's God's grace policy. And every time we do it, we are showing humility. Instead of the three arrogant skills, self-justification, self-deception, and self-absorption. So humble yourselves before the Lord. Well, uh, this is a prerequisite. And part of that deals with the rebound. And uh, James talks a lot about rebound. Uh, you might not see it right off, but when we go over James, you'll see uh, where James talks about a rebound. But he uses words like cleanse your hands, etc. And it just means to name your sins. And then you'll be cleansed from all wrongdoing. A reference to 1 John 1, nine. So this means that humility is a system of divine viewpoint thinking related to grace orientation and occupation with Christ. And humility must become our way of life, and humility actually becomes the basis for our wisdom, which is Sophia in the Greek. And humility is a system of thinking that reaches its peak, as I said, under spiritual self-esteem, and that's because when we reach spiritual self-esteem, uh, suddenly God is going to send upon us something that we cannot handle, something that makes us totally helpless and hopeless, nothing that can be solved by any human power, and we're going to have to rely on divine power. And uh, at the point of spiritual self-esteem, if somebody ever comes up to you and brags to you, I've just reached spiritual maturity, run in the other direction because they are about to uh, be hit with the four stages of uh, the... Uh, the four stages of momentum testing and the four stages of, and actually uh, this will be providential preventative suffering, and they're about to be made helpless. And uh, you might look funny when you hear that, but some people, uh, especially in the large church of, of Baraka, would, uh, uh, when the colonel first started out teaching these things, they got a little excited about it, and some young men started using it as a, a dating uh, tool because a lot of the... Um, well, there were a lot of beautiful women in Baraka Church. Still are. Always have been. I don't know why. They just are. Beautiful inside and out for the most part. And then uh, uh, some of the young men would uh, come there just to see the ladies. And uh, they would go up to the lady after church and say, I've just reached spiritual maturity. Let's go out and celebrate. It sounds stupid. And uh, most of the young ladies probably had enough sense to say, you're an idiot. But some of them use doctrine, and you'll always run across people who want to use it to their advantage, either to find a mate or to get rich 
A lot of people have get rich schemes, and uh, a lot of people use churches for money and all that. And I, I can't, I don't know how many, there's been several people that come by the house there with the sign in front of it, and the only thing they've been looking for is food or money. And they act interested in what you got to say, but all they want is a free handout. And one of them the other day, I was talking to him, he said, yeah, man, I'm going to come to your church Sunday. I said, well, everybody's welcome. He was a black fellow. I said, well, everybody's welcome. He said, and nobody going to say nothing about me being there? I said, no, everybody's welcome here. And, uh, and then he said, um, well, I got diabetes. I'm going home. You got any food? And then, well, I got a sandwich. I don't got much more food than you do. You want a sandwich? And no, he didn't want a sandwich. He wanted me to hand out, I guess, uh, frozen foods and chickens and all kind of stuff. I don't know what. But uh, then he left and never showed up again. And most people are looking for a handout. And that's people using uh, other people. And that's not part of it. But it, it happens even in doctrinal churches. And always remember, when you're, whenever you attend one, whether it be this one or another one, uh, not everyone in that church, uh, hopefully in this one it's true, but not everyone is uh, uh, going to be on the up and up. Uh, we all have uh, sin natures, and there's always nefarious people that walk in and out. So uh, as a way of life, mostly here it's out, so that's the way I like it. As a way of life, uh, humility, in, and I don't say that to be harsh, uh, I, if people want it, they'll get it. I want you to understand that. If people want doctrine, they'll get it, and they'll be able to stick through it. And they'll be able to handle it. And I'm never going to be mean to somebody just to, for the sake of, of being mean because they're new and walking in. That's not true. I'll just give doctrine. And usually they, on their own free will, walk out. That's what I'm saying. So as a way of life, humility is grace, orientation, and capacity for life. And it also includes capacity for love, happiness, and capacity for gratitude. Arrogant people have no gratitude. And one of the verses in the Bible talks about uh, arrogant young people who have no gratitude uh, toward their parents. Remember, uh, your parents uh, wiped your butt. Your parents uh, provided for you and sacrificed for you and will their whole lives probably. And, and, and the teenage years become times when you might want to lose some gratitude concerning that because your parents might be a little stricter than others. So what? you got all the time in the world to live life uh, once you get old enough to handle it. If you get a little too much freedom too young, you might uh, ruin yourselves in it. It all it does have. I've seen it happen in my generation. And young people go off on a tan of partying and drinking, and then they get into drugs, and it ruins. It'll ruin your life. You might come back to doctrine later, but it will destroy you. And that means lack of humility. And if your parents don't want you to hang out with a certain uh, type of person, don't do it. They're, they're, they've been around longer than you, and they're smarter than you, whether you realize it or not. And they know that, and they might notice some uh, a guy not being too humble about things and having a type of thinking against authority. I told the teacher off, etc. Well, your parents say, don't hang around that person. He's a jerk. He doesn't know any better about life, and he's going to be a failure. And then you say, no, nah, he's cool. No, he's not. He's an idiot. And if you follow in the footsteps of rebellious people and then the footsteps of idiot, idiots, you too will turn out to be an idiot and you'll fail in life and you'll suffer. You're going to have enough suffering in life. Don't start now. Enjoy it now and have humility. And uh, when you get in the car, don't speed and act like a cool uh, person. That, that Those things are dangerous and I don't want to be on the road while you're going crazy. And so calm down and just relax. Uh, you'll get old enough and have enough freedom once you, uh, uh, once you get of age, and then you'll be able to enjoy what you want and maybe by then have enough responsibility for it. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege to study this portion of the Word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to the importance of having humility. May we learn to have humility as a way of life and to have it in the expression of our love for Jesus Christ through consistent uh, metabolization, uh, perception, metabolization, and application of the Word of God. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.